This video is going to cover section 7.2 bacteria in nature. We are going to talk about the good bacteria, the bad bacteria, and the downright ugly. Okay, scratch the ugly part, but um, the good bacteria, the beneficial bacteria. First off, we have a lot of bacteria that are responsible for decomposing things. And so um, they fit into the category of decomposition, the breaking down of dead organisms in organic wastes. Can you imagine a world where things did not break down? I mean, we would be walking on dead stuff. Um, it's like a tree falls. Yeah, I know it takes a couple of years for that tree to decompose, but you know, a tree falls and it doesn't break down. Dead things, you know, lying around, they never break down. Um, so decomposition, why is it good? It recycles nutrients back to the soil. So you are made up of atoms and nutrients and particles that can be used by another organism. So when things decompose, um, basically other organisms can utilize those atoms for other things, to make other things. Second way that bacteria can be beneficial is in the process of nitrogen fixation. So if I were to ask you, what's the number one gas in our atmosphere? A lot of kids, you know, say carbon dioxide. I'm like, no, that's only 0.03%. Uh, then they're like oxygen. I'm like, no, that's only 22%. And then they figure out that it's nitrogen because I'm talking about nitrogen fixation. 70% of the um, atmospheric composition on planet Earth is made up of nitrogen gas, N2. And this form of nitrogen, nitrogen is actually useless to us. Why do we need nitrogen? Well, we need nitrogen to make DNA. We need nitrogen to make um, other macromolecules. So nitrogen gas is useless to us. We can't utilize it. However, there is a, a species, species of bacteria that do use nitrogen gas. They take it in and they convert it into other nitrogen compounds that are usable by living things. Ignore this bottom part. This is from last year. So here's a diagram of the nitrogen cycle. We have nitrogen in the atmosphere, and in the soil we have these nitrogen-fixing bacteria either hanging out in the nodules of the roots of legumes like soybeans or just in the soil, and what they do is they bring in nitrogen, and they convert it into ammonium. And then we also have another type of bacteria that take that ammonia and convert it into nitrates, which can be converted into nitri um, nitrites. Wait, I think I said that wrong. Nitrites and nitrates. And these are forms that are usable by plants. And who eats plants? Animals. We do. So then we can utilize those forms of nitrogen to make macromolecules. And then obviously when living things die, they decompose. And the process, you know, it's, it's a cycle. It repeats itself. Okay. There are other forms of bacteria that take these nitrates and nitrates and convert it back into nitrogen gas, but um, we're really focusing on the bacteria over here uh, that bring in that nitrogen that's in an unusable form and convert it into a usable form. Another way bacteria can be beneficial is through a process called bioremediation. So when you break down the word bioremediation, bio means life and remediation uh, means to like remedy, to fix, to heal. And so we are going to use these organisms to clean up environmental pollution. Believe it or not, there are species of bacteria out there that love oil, that will take uranium and convert it into a less harmful substance, that break down, you know, like sewage. We use um, a lot of Oh, no, that's not where I wanted to go with that. Nope, scratch that. But bioremediation, um, let's just focus in on the diagram here with oil. So here's my bacteria, and there's this little oil droplet, and he eats it, and now the oil is dead, even though the oil is not alive. But this oil can be broken down into water and other harmless gases and released into or back to nature. So when there are oil spills, yeah, depending on where that's, that oil spills at, they might actually put in these species of bacteria to break it down into a less harmful material. Uh, finally, uh, the final way, and there's actually way more beneficial bacteria out there, but your book's only going to highlight on these four, bacteria and food. We use bacteria in the making of a lot of dairy products, okay? Yogurt, cheese, buttermilk, okay? Um, chocolate, and in the process of making chocolate, you need bacteria to kind of break down the cocoa bean, okay? Sometimes the taste of chocolate um, is brought on by a species of bacteria. So we use bacteria a lot in the process of making food, different types of food, okay? Pickles, okay? Let's talk about the bad bacteria, the harmful bacteria. So a vocab term you should know is called a pathogen. It's an agent that can cause disease. Now. 
bacteria can be harmful, okay? Most are not. I mean, I know when you think of bacteria, you're like, oh, that's a bad thing. But most bacteria are actually helpful. But there are some out there that are harmful, that can cause a disease. And if that's the case, we call them a pathogen. Now, there are other forms of pathogens, like viruses can be a pathogen. They can bring on a disease. Fungi can be a pathogen. They can bring on disease. Um, so just know that pathogen is a term that can be used by anything if it causes a disease. So bacterial diseases make you sick by one of two ways. First off, they damage your tissues. Okay, so they can make you sick by damaging your tissues, like tuberculosis. Okay, another way that it, bacterial diseases make you sick is by releasing toxins, like botulism. So let's go back on to the tub tuberculosis here. Um, that is a bacterial infection or disease um, brought on by, well, I guess a bacteria, but it doesn't take a lot of bacteria to start it, okay? I, I read a book um, on it, and it says it only is, it can start with 10. 10 bacteria organisms can bring about tuberculosis. What tuberculosis does is it um, affects your lungs. They make a home in, their, in your lungs. They basically ruin your lung tissue, and they, they show up on x-rays, so... Um, but it's, it's contagious, so just, yeah, tuberculosis. Botulism. What botulism does is it affects your nervous system. So these mature bacteria release toxins, and you consume it in some way or get it inside your body, and it inhibits nerves, okay? So they don't communicate with one another, and so as a result, muscles cannot contract, and you might get like lockjaw or, or something like that. So that's botulism. How do we treat bacteria? We treat them with antibiotics, medicines that stop the growth and reproduction of bacteria. Bacteria, um, you know, they can be targeted by antibiotics by a few ways. Some form of antibiotics like target the cell wall. They drill holes into the cell wall and they try to um, flood the bacteria cell. Some affect the ribosomes. Okay, why is that important? What do ribosomes do for a cell? Ribosomes make proteins for a cell. So if you take them out, then you can't make things for the cell anymore. And, you know, the cell needs to make things, you know, like vacuoles and other structures and when organelles need damage and repair and, and vesicles, whatever. Um, you take out the ribosomes, eventually that bacteria cell is going to die, okay? On the flip side, bacteria have become immune to antibiotics, okay? So, like, when you take antibiotics, it's really important that you take the antibiotics for the full dosage. A lot of times, you have to take it for 10 days. You know, take this pill two times a day with food. Uh, for 10 days. And around day six, day seven, people are like, hey, my bacterial infection, my swelling, whatever, it, it looks good. I'm feeling great. And they stop taking their antibiotics. That's bad. Okay. Take it for the full dosage because if you stop early, there could be some bacteria strands that were not killed. Okay. And they might become immune to that antibiotic. Um, and a resistance to antibiotics can be also brought on by random mutations. But as a result, diseases are becoming more difficult to treat because of over uh, use of antibiotics by us, not taking the full dosage, and of course, the random mutations. So MRSA is a strain of bacteria that is resistant to a lot of antibiotics. Okay, it's a serious thing. If you do have MRSA, you know, that when people treat you, they're like gowned and masked up. I remember when I got cellulitis in my eye, and I was actually hospitalized for a few days because it was that bad. I mean, my face was swollen. Um, you, the person that come in to do housekeeping in the room, I mean, they were fully masked because they were afraid that I had MRSA and they had to wait for the test results to come back. Um, you may remember this fall when I, again, cellulitis um, came back in my eye. And I went and my eye was swollen. It looked like I got into a fight, like a boxing match. And I think I told you the story about how I went in and they're like, oh my goodness, yes, we're going to prescribe you an antibiotic, but you know what? We're also going to give you a shot. So the nurse left and I'm like, okay, I'm going to get a shot of antibiotics. Okay. So I like, I pull up my arm sleeves and I'm, you know, ready for this shot. She comes back in. She's like, oh no, that's not where the shot's going to go because this needle's big. Um, and I'm sure you can guess where that shot went. Not where I was expecting it, but um, yeah. So um, antibiotics, make sure you take the full dosage. So here's a diagram showing 
the different targets antibiotics can target in a bacteria cell, like the cell walls, they drill holes. Sometimes they mess up the DNA RNA synthesis. Uh, sometimes, I don't even know what that is. I'm just gonna move on. Um, they mess up the cell membrane or the ribosomes. But on the flip side, there are bacteria strands out there that have formed a resistance. So I, talk, I talked about drilling a hole. Well, there are some of them that kind of like plug the holes back up as soon as the hole is drilled so they're not affected by it. Um, there are some that like bypass it, the ribosomes are not affected by it or their DNA is not messed up. Okay, so um, it's kind of like an arms race between antibiotics and um, bacteria cells. Okay, the final thing I wanna talk about is food poisoning. So bacteria are everywhere. Okay, it's, they're on your skin. They're, I mean, they're just, they're, they cover every surface you can think of. And um, your food, your food is covered with bacteria, just so you know. I know that probably grosses you out, even if it's cooked in one. I mean, there's still bacteria on there. So um, all food has bacteria, and eventually it's going to break down, and, and bacteria is going to spoil that food. I mean, that's usually how food spoils. There's, it's a growth of bacteria, and it breaks down and decomposes, and it, you, know, you, you get all that stuff, right? Um, so what are a few ways that we can prolong the shelf life of food? What, are, what, what do we do with our food? Well, okay, we might put it in a, a seal tight container. We might refrigerate it. We might freeze it. Um, we might can it, pickle it, salt it, cure it. I mean, there's lots of ways that we try to prolong the shelf life of food, okay? Well, there's one way that we can do that and that is through a process called pasteurization, okay? Um, it, what, what you do is you take whatever you want pasteurized and you expose it to a very high temperature that kills most harmful bacteria and then they cool it and then they package it. So milk is pasteurized, okay? The milk that you buy in a store. Orange juice tends to be pasteurized um, in a store. Um, so when you see that word, that's what it means. It means it was exposed to high temperatures and then it cooled, okay? So yeah, that does it for notes. We read out of the book, we didn't finish it. We'll read out of the book tomorrow and the assignment will also post.